Hello, welcome to Inside Bodymore, our match preview show on Claret and Blue. I'm Dan Ronson, joined by John Townley, fresh back from Poland this morning to talk about all things Chelsea. And we'll, we'll also look at uh, Legia Warsaw in a little bit more detail as well. We'll talk to Emery's press conference, although it was very short, and we'll explain why in a second. Our predicted 11 and our predictions for the match as well, where I've taken a commanding lead, John, in the predictions table. You'll be uh, gutted to know, I'm sure. Yeah, doing well, thanks, Dan. I don't know about fresh from Warsaw, but... Um... <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> I'm tired and, uh, yeah, I'm lacking a bit of sleep. But it was a really good time out in Poland for a few days. Obviously, not the result that we wanted, but I thoroughly enjoyed my experience nonetheless. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. For those that are listening to this show, John is. You won't be able to tell, but he's not in his usual location. He's in a, in front of a different blank wall instead, but you don't have your microphone because you, you're at your parents uh, rather than your own place. So apologies if the sound quality is not what we usually expect, but um, you know it's a one-off. Let's talk about the presser then, and I should say the presser in inverted quotes. It's not a presser in the way that we usually expect. Can you just explain what you and I have spoken about and who to? The squad's returned to Birmingham straight after the game against Legia, but obviously all the journalists are still going to be in Poland. Um, or arriving back from Birmingham in the morning. So, therefore, that's, there's not much point in doing a, a, um, a press conference at Bodymore as as normal. There was obviously a press conference last night about the game. So, I think just for Premier League rules, maybe, there was still some uh, Premier League production staff that went to Bodymore Heath to get, I think it was like a four-minute uh, press conference done at Bodymore. So, Emery wasn't in there for very long, like 10 minutes of that. So, um, yeah, but he still said a couple of things that we'll get on to. But yeah, the reason why there was no press conference was because there was one last night and it's a lot of media duties that Emery's had over the last week or so. And then you've got obviously the Chelsea game, then you've got Everton next week. And then I presume it'll be a normal press conference next week for the Brighton. Brighton. Yeah. So, things should be uh, moving back to normal by them you mentioned you said some interesting things what are those interesting <laughs> things john <laughs> yeah he left john a hook mainly that he admitted that he made a tactical mistake he didn't go into detail about what the mistake was or um or anything like that but it was just interesting i thought because last night he didn't mention that i think maybe just i don't know he maybe slept on it and thought okay actually i shouldn't have done this or i shouldn't have asked certain players to do something i don't know he didn't want to go into detail about it in his press conference today but yesterday he was also you know he, he wasn't going to pin any blame on individuals as well he said that he could have started this the same team that beat palace um his first 11 as he called it he said that he could have started his first 11 they would have you know probably still struggled and not won the game against legia so i think it's one of those where he didn't want to pin any blame on anyone and also he kind of you know held his hands up and said that tactically I've got some things wrong too. So I thought that was interesting because I don't think we've heard Emery kind of, adm- I don't want to say admit it, you know, there's nothing wrong, you know, with, um, with not saying that he made a tactical mistake or that he did or didn't, you know, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day, but I just thought it was interesting, especially after a game like that where really I think those, that group of players, whatever Emery really asks of them, should be doing better against... Mm. It, you know that team Legia with, with all due respect and by the way full credit to them they were like 10 out of 10 across the park they were excellent and so were the fans um but a Villa team that consists of you know World Cup winners um international players players that cost tens of millions of pounds that are on 100,000 you know hundreds of thousand pounds a week and they should be going there and putting up a better fight than what they did yeah me and Matt did the post-match reaction last night and we were uh, we were chatting through the game and our thoughts and it was, you know, it's not the end of the world to have lost when there's five more group stage games to go. But, you know, it's frustrating. This kind of big return to Europe to be faced with a, a 3-2 defeat away from home is annoying, isn't it? And we've been through it and I urge people that have not seen that to go back and watch that if you can stomach uh, half an hour of chat about uh, Legia Warsaw. Although we spoke about some random topics as you would as as you would always expect from the Car Blue podcast. Let's go to injury update then. Are we as we were? No, nothing fresh since since last night? No. So Emery said he's going to basically assess the squad tomorrow. So uh, yeah. the players who didn't start the game trained like physically today and the players who didn't were basically having like a recovery day at Bodymore. So tomorrow Emery's then going to go over the Chelsea game, prepare them for it. I don't know if that's something that he's going to do for every, well, I presume it is for every uh, weekend game after a Thursday Europa Conference League game. You'd have a Friday recovery and maybe a Saturday light training. training. Yes, yeah, Saturday training, a light training session, but mainly it's going to be tactical work ahead of the game that they'll play on Sunday, obviously Chelsea this weekend. So he said that he's going to basically wait and see which players are 100%, which again might be a bit interesting because that is, you know, 
you're basically saying that there'll probably be some players maybe that played against Legia that, that won't be 100% for Chelsea and therefore they won't play. We don't know who they are, of course. And an update on Diego Carlos. He mentioned last night that, that, that he's hoping that he'll return next week um, to training. So you're possibly looking at the Brighton game. Maybe that's too early and it'll be the game after that, which is... Wolves? Yes. Well, must are, but Wolves in the Premier League, yes. So mm. that week, two weeks away. I don't know how to put it, but like Carlos, I think, actually gives you quite a, quite a few different options in a way because I was we'll go into the predicted 11 later on, but I was trying to work out, well, if we only have two centre-backs, who drops into the back three? Well, it has to be Kamara. Obviously, yeah. if they play with three when they uh, build in possession. But Carlos not having him, all of a sudden, it's like, well, you have to play Kamara in that back three because Longley can't. I don't think play with Torres because they're so similar. And, you know, I think he struggled yesterday at points, not as much as what people made out, I must say. But, you know, he wasn't his best game by by a long way. And obviously Chambers. Quite, Emery, quite a long way, you could say. Jesus. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you got to laugh. And Chambers struggled as well. And Emery even said, to be fair, um, previously, I think it was when I was in America, I asked him about Chambers and, and his future. And he said that he's he doesn't see him as a centre-back. It's more so as a right-back or a hard midfielder. He's not going to be playing in the centre of defence either. So, yeah, Carlos coming back, I actually think it will be a big boost when it happens. And mm. then finally, Villa will have a fully strength. Oh, actually, no, I, I, I forgot, of course, timings and when they were out for pretty much the whole season. So from the players that they have, it's then kind of full strength after them. Yeah, less said about Callum Chambers playing anywhere, the better, to be honest. Uh, pretty drab performance from him. Let's go away for match day then. This is the part of the show where we talk about something that isn't about the upcoming fixture. In this case, obviously Chelsea away. Uh, and we, rather than talk about a kit launch or a season ticket update or whatever it is, we're going to talk about a different game, the Legia Warsaw, of course. But a little bit around the edges, I suppose, because like I said, we've done a post-match reaction already. I've given my thoughts on it. I'll get some of your thoughts on the game as well in a second. What was the trip like? I'm, I'm just interested in what like the first proper European trip was like, because Hibs away doesn't really count, does it? <laughs> yeah, Hibs away was kind of a I don't know, strange strange game. It felt like a friendly or a John McGinn testimonial. But uh, also was brilliant. Like thoroughly enjoyed it. It was um, like what an experience, genuinely. Uh, you know, to travel. Obviously, I'm doing it as a job, but it doesn't feel like a job at all. Um, like I'm privileged to do it and to get out there. I know a lot of fans wouldn't be able to. Firstly, because of the money, and then secondly, because you know you can't get a ticket. I think there was 1,700 uh, capacity. Mm-hmm that game there's going to be less for like Mostar which I don't think I'm going to be going to because it's so hard to get to and you know the cost implications as well to, because of that but yeah uh, Warsaw was class like really enjoyed it I, I was there since, uh, from Tuesday till well Friday morning um, it's brilliant yeah meeting fans going from Irish bar to Irish bar on uh, in downtown Warsaw which is where um, Villa were kind of I don't know, told to stay, I suppose, by um, by the officials there, I presume. Yeah, really enjoyed it. Kind of didn't didn't go and see everything that Warsaw had to offer because it's a, like a huge city. Enjoyed myself nonetheless. And I'm, I'm already looking forward to Alkmaar, which is in five weeks, I believe. Let's talk about the game then very quickly. Like I said, I've given my thoughts, so I don't want to go through it again, really. What did you make of the performance? Did you think that Emery underestimated them? Or do you agree with what Matt said, that he maybe overestimated uh second string players I think it's a bit of both because well firstly when the team came out I was in the press room and I said straight away you, you know we're kind of asking for trouble by mm. making five changes would, would, would be my was sorry was what I said uh in the press conference before you had the Polish press asking us you know how many changes do you think and I, I was wrong I said I, I maybe one or two because Emery will want to win kind of get the first three games done in the conference league get nine points on the board and then you're pretty much you know through at that point because then you've got another couple of home games I think or maybe one yeah two more home games I think after the next three so I'm surprised he made that many changes however as I said earlier there's, there's no excuse for those players not to put in a performance and not to come away with three points there isn't and I don't blame Emery for making the changes because ultimately he knows what he's doing in this in this competition and to be honest I think when he made the five alterations bringing on Diaby Watkins you know Ramsey all of Villa's firepower on you know they were all on from the 70th minute plus I actually thought that we were going to go on to win it still because yeah, Leggy we were Leggy and they dropped deep <laughs> so many puns they were like dropped 10 yards and um Villa had great chances, didn't they? And if they score those, you know, you, maybe they do win it. But I, I almost felt like, well, Villa, considering how Leggy applied firstly and how Villa played, Villa didn't deserve anything from it. Because if you're that team that's, that on paper is so much better, 
you have to go there and impose yourself and not mm. be intimidated by the atmosphere. And it was the best atmosphere I've ever witnessed, if that makes sense. Like it, the noise was different level, seriously. Like whenever, I don't know if it came through too well on the TV, but every time Villa progressed the ball through, even in their own half, the whistles, it was piercing, like really, um, really loud. And I don't know what that would, would have been like. Um, pitch side as well, probably even louder. So the Legia fans are outstanding. I've never heard support like that. Don't underestimate anyone for a start, but also now you've experienced it, you can then go into your next games and kind of prepare better. And to be honest, I don't think anything will be more hostile than what that was. Hmm. You know, I'm still expecting tough games against Alkmaar, tough games against you know whoever Villa play in the knockouts if they get there. But that particular game, I think, was kind of the one where I wouldn't have played Longley, Chambers, and made so many, not because they're poor players, I'm not saying that, but because they're coming in from the cold, really. It's the first game, yeah. really. Hibernian for Chambers isn't a game. That's you know, How do you get of, those second string up to speed without just playing them? The, you know, they've got to play at some point, haven't they? Yeah, but I play them. Yeah. I just feel like we invited trouble by making those changes, and we were we lacked composure. We, did, we didn't control the game, and because we didn't control the game, we were so far up with the pitch, and I think that was maybe the tactical thing that Emery was going on about because he said that we tried to control the game but we didn't and because we didn't control the game we were out of position and things like that so, yeah and by the way all three goals were really poor defending um like kind of amateur stuff so yeah but full credit to Legia that you know they did their bit let's go back to the Chelsea game and we're going to go through a predicted 11 this is your predicted 11 for what you think Unai Emery will do against them uh, I've got the graphic in front of me which will flash up on screen in a sec but uh, just talk me through the starting 11 first of all out of possession and then we'll talk through what it will look like when Villa have got the ball yeah so out of possession just a 4-4-2 kind of standard Martinez in goal got cash at right back I am playing Alex Moreno actually I thought Luca Dean was obviously poor against Legia Yes, he scored, obviously to a deflection, but I'm going to kind of take it away from him. But for all three goals, he made mistakes. And yes, the, kind of the whole defence was um, accountable for errors as well. But yeah, I'd bring in Moreno now. I think it's probably time for him to come back into the fold and play alongside uh, Torres and Conza in the back line. I'm playing Kamara and Luis in the double pivot. And then I've got John McGinn, Zaniolo to keep his place and Diaby and Watkins up front. So in possession, that's a back three of Conza, Torres and Kamara, like it was against Palace, with the only change being that uh, Moreno is going to play as basically a left winger instead of Luca Dean. Is there any possibility or any shouts that John Durant should be starting this game against Chelsea? Scored again against Legia. Is it something like four goals in 200 minutes or something for him now? Yeah, he's averaging 50 goals. 50 goal, uh, a goal every 50 minutes. <laughs> 50 goals would have been brilliant. <laughs> it should be starting. Uh, yeah, a goal every 50 minutes. Again, I'll say what I said last week and Ollie Watkins should still start for me. It's... Um, in a Premier League game away away to Stamford Bridge, he still gives you everything that you need. I'm not going to talk about it again because I'm tired of it. But um, listen, I think John Duran's an excellent player, and I'm really excited by what he can bring. There's a lot to his game that stands like he's when he leaps in the air, he was in the air for about half a second, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it is. And um, well, it's a very good finish. I said that on the show last night. It was a very smart kind of way. He jumped for the ball and headed it down. It, that that very could, very easily could have gone wrong. That it, Hits him in the face because he missed time to jump something. I know it looks an easy chance. I don't think it was. And again, the keeper makes a top save before half time when he yeah. receives the ball from Bailey, turns, uses his strength against the centre back. Um, I think he was a 26 year old centre back, so he's much more experienced than Duran, uses his body well. And um, I believe he's pulled down, probably should have been a penalty, but he still gets his shot off. And that was going in if it weren't for a top save by the keeper. So fair play. I, I think that's, that's a good thing that he's in competition with Watkins. The only thing I'd say is that I remember Watkins was talking about um, when Danny Ings was at the club. And I think he said something like, obviously they, they got on well, but um, I think he said when Ings left, it kind of allowed him to, I don't know, maybe play with more freedom, which then he scored so many goals with. I I don't know whether Duran playing well. I don't know if maybe Watkins is, kind of feels the pressure by someone playing underneath him and playing well. I don't know. Do you know what I'm trying Possibly, to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that if John Durant didn't exist, maybe Watkins would be performing better. But because he feels like there's someone breathing down his neck, rather than right to the challenge, he almost buckles under the pressure of, I might be about to be replaced here, rather than kind of using that as fuel yeah. for going yeah. on a run. Yeah, it's only because he mentioned it, and I remember it a few months ago. When yeah, that's fair. He, he prefers to kind of be the main man, and that's what gets the best out of him. But hey, listen, he could, you know, I, I think we all know that Watkins is still going to be the number nine throughout the season. It, but we 
John Duran playing well is everything that we need <laughs> anyway. So mm. you need confidence in places. It's just that Watkins kind of commented on it before and maybe suggested that he likes to be free to go about his business but he's still the number nine moving forward so well, I don't want to single out Kamara too much we've spoken about him a couple of times in recent weeks but I don't think he's had a great start to the season and we've talked about him before about like I kind of go missing for want of a better phrase in, in the big games when you've expected to have a bit of fight about you but as you've said before no one can do the role he does in midfield and if Villa are playing this system where one of the midfielders has to drop into the back line to support a back three only Kamara can do that at the moment as well so even though he's not in the best form, he kind of has to play for this system to work to allow Cash to get further yeah. forward. Is there any possibility of Ramsey coming in for a start here as well? That would be two changes to that left-hand side with Moreno and Ramsey coming back, who of course would have been the starting pair had they been fit and, and played all you know, throughout pre-season. That would be that left-hand side. Would it be too early for Ramsey to be starting games, do you think? I don't think so. I mean, he's going to start one of the next two games, I'd have thought, because he's, he's fit I'd and he's ready. Everything, I think. Yeah, possibly so. Uh, so... Uh, yeah, it's obviously a tight turnaround from the game uh, on Thursday night. But us, press lot, were talking, going to the airport, and we were saying, like, well, I mean, I don't think many people forget, but Villa have missed their whole left side mm, <laughs> so yeah. far this season. And with Torres, and if you look at the kind of the passing sequences and what's it, the, the kind of passing maps that you see on social media sometimes and obviously on the, the stat pages, the, the thickness of the line... <laughs> I don't know if that's the term. It's so, or it's, it's such a bolder line, if that makes sense, from where Torres is passing the ball. And it's always to Luca Dean, usually. Mm-hmm. And you just think, well, Villa have Villa have been missing Moreno and uh, Ramsey. They've got Torres, who's new as well, but also a player who's fully capable of progressing the ball so very well that Moreno and Ramsey are going to have a lot of joy down that left. So you're almost looking at a new... I'm not saying new, it's obviously not a new team, but that gives Villa so much more now, um, which is really exciting because I do think Zaniolo has done well and I actually think Luca Dean's done very well up until that game against Legia. Oh, obviously, Newcastle and Liverpool happened, but no one really performed in those games. Uh, but Villa have that whole left side, kind of new and fresh, ready to go. Maybe maybe we'll see it more, more so after the October international break, but that's something to look forward to. And yeah, yeah. to have two guys like Moreno and Ramsey back, that's two huge boosts. Next up is the opposition view. John, it's back. Yes, everyone's favourite part of the show. Uh, obviously, we missed it for the Crystal Palace game for various reasons. But I caught up with Scott Trotter from Football London to get the lowdown on what we can expect from the Chelsea side of things. So uh, take it away, early in me and Scott. Right, Scott, thanks for joining me. How are you? Yeah, not bad at all. Thank you. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad. I was on late last night for um, the, the Europa Conference League game and we're recording this part of the show early in the morning. So I've got my coffee um, and let's try and just get through this next 10 minutes the best way we can. Uh, the concept for this part of the show is I've got five questions for you, the opposition side, uh, looking at Chelsea, looking at Villa a little bit and a score prediction, of course. So I've got a couple of notes in front of me. So forgive me if I'm, I'm reading a couple of bits, but I want to make sure I get the numbers right. Chelsea, 13th in the Premier League table. One win, which was against Luton. Two draws and two defeats. Uh, the outsider opinion is that it, it doesn't look good for Chelsea. Is it as bad as people might suggest or are we kind of over overanalyzing it a little bit? It's a tough one to kind of assess at the moment. It, I will say it doesn't feel quite as bad as last season did at times yet. I think the main thing for Chelsea this season is just kind of what is familiar from last season and they really struggle to put the ball in the nest. I think it's five goals in the first five games and that is kind of a situation that's always going to leave the opposition in with a chance, particularly when you look at, I think, three of the goals came against Luton as well. So it's yeah. it's been a very concentrated. The actual play itself has been better. Chelsea have kind of controlled most of the games if you look at kind of you know the buzzwords the underlying stats of the xg and stuff like that that all looks very good um apart from the fact chelsea are underperforming in terms of what they're actually converting so much now kind of entering that phase where kind of five games into the season it's not been the most difficult kind of schedule so far that starts to increase in difficulty now a little bit and they really kind of need three points as a sign of some momentum for all of everything that might be going well or looking better on the pitch you know you you start to worry when those points aren't on the board I guess the other thing the caveat that is there is that Chelsea have had so many injuries I think 12 players kind of missed the game uh, against Bournemouth Mm. last weekend and you know the the bench had I think only Ben Chilwell who'd made more than three Premier League uh, League starts on it 
and only three of the bench had played for Chelsea at all um, at the senior level. So it, it is a precarious situation, a difficult situation for, for Pochettino. Um, you know, they, they got so much momentum during preseason and it looked like it was going to be a really positive start, but things have kind of maybe not quite taken a turn, but it's definitely became more subdued and this kind of stretch till the next international break is going to be super important because late in October, they have a crazy run of like Arsenal, Tottenham and Man City all in hmm. just a few weeks of each other. Just sort of a lot of memes, isn't there, around Chelsea <laughs> at the moment? I don't want to like boil down football analysis to that, but the one that was doing rounds after Bournemouth of Nicholas Jackson's uh, shot and how big the goal would have to have increased by <laughs> it was like 300%. It's quite funny from an outside perspective, but from a Chelsea fan's perspective, it must be very, very frustrating. What is the strategy? From Chelsea, you've signed so many players, spent an absolute fortune since Todd Bowley came in. You've got Pochin now, who's got a great reputation, and there seems to be a lot of potential there with the manager and the players that you've signed. But then again, from an outsider's perspective, you see like the team sheet announcement coming up at, at two o'clock, and you think they spent a billion pounds and that's what they're putting out. That's their bench. Like, I know you've got the injuries, like you mentioned, but what's the strategy? It just seems like a lack of joined up thinking to me. Just like, here's a load of potential, we hope this works. Fingers crossed it does. That's what it looks like. Without being too harsh, the perhaps is an element of that. They are looking for kind of the best young players in the world. And I think there's an element of trying to find those talents sooner to perhaps, you know, either get the next best thing or to be able to sell them on for a profit later on. I think there's a bit of wariness from my end about the amount of money they have spent on some of these young players. It's still, you know, tens, twenties, thirty million pounds. It's it's not like mm. these players are coming in for nothing. I guess Leslie Chukwu is one who came in maybe a surprise. He was expected to go out on loan. Obviously, Chelsea now have the connection to Strasbourg and stuff, but he has kind of stuck around and with um, Moises Caicedo, another significant expenditure. He's not very old himself, despite his kind of lofty reputation, uh, looking to be out injured. He he was against Bournemouth. We saw Chukwu and he looked promising. There's this idea of, of young talent. There's this idea to have, you know, multiple players for, for said positions, you know, it was, I guess, 12 months ago, we spoke a lot about Chelsea kind of needing to replenish the midfield. Um, they mm. got rid of Kante, they got rid of Kovacic, and then, of course, guys like Mount and Havertz. That was that was a big thing this summer to kind of sell players to reduce the squad numbers. But now we have this kind of crazy valuable midfield of Enzo Fernandez. They spent $100 million on Caicedo, they spent $100 million on Romeo Lavia, and then there's still guys like Conor Gallagher in, in the side as well. It's it has been difficult to kind of work it all out. I think there's a sign that this is a long-term project, but as Pochettino mm. kind of keeps on saying, the idea is also to win now. Um, at the moment, that's maybe a little bit more difficult to see how it's going to happen. So yeah, I guess, I guess the plan is to to try and be successful for the long term, but you know, there's still a lot to prove for the moment. Yeah, Chelsea might be good in six months' time or a year's time or, or two years' time, whatever it might be in terms of, when I say good, I mean getting back into the Champions League and competing for the, the, the title, which is where Chelsea probably expect they should be, certainly for the amount of money that they've spent. This game specifically coming up on Sunday, from a Villa point of view, you think, well, let's catch them cold. They're not ready yet. That They've got loads of injuries. Let's go to Stamford Bridge while Chelsea aren't scoring goals and, and try and win the game. And, and hopefully Villa do do that. Just on the two sides very quickly, Villa obviously come off the back of their Europa Conference League defeat against Legia Warsaw last night. Chelsea coming off the back of a 0-0 draw with Bournemouth. You've had a, a full week to prepare. Chelsea only scored five goals in the league, three of those against Luton, two goalless games in September. Chelsea's goal of the month for September is looking pretty bleak, isn't it? Without a goal to, to choose from so far. I'm absolutely jinxing this now that you, you score a hatful against Villa. From Villa, though, we're leaking goals away from home. Five against Newcastle on the opening day, three against Liverpool away, three against Legia Warsaw in the Europa, League, uh, Europa Conference League as well. Before we get into like a specific score prediction, how do you see those two sides matching up? It's really interesting with Nicholas Jackson because for all, he's I think he scored the one goal against Luton and... You know, you kind of know the meme, and he has had a whole catalogue of misses. He's surprisingly quite well liked. His all round performances, maybe not so much against Bournemouth, but before that, were really, really promising. He gets so involved. He's kind of just this all round presence, looks to get in behind. And I think maybe that is one area where, you know, this season Chelsea haven't been able to unleash him quite so much. I think there's a school of thought that, you know, if, if a team looks more to kind of push up the pitch against Chelsea and have a bit of time and leaves that bit space, that you know, Chelsea are going to be a bit more suited to that rather than, mm. you know, the the teams who perhaps struggle a bit more, set the low block and, you know, Chelsea have got to find something. That, that's that been a real issue for the club for, for a number of seasons now, that kind of moment of creativity. And, 
you know, maybe that can prove true against a, a team like Villa who do have so many attacking talents of their own. If Chelsea can find a goal early, uh, again, you, you kind of risk going into cliche. It looks like they may, maybe can kick on. Jackson can get some confidence. Villa should see an opportunity. It's just that boils down to that same old thing. And I think I said it a lot of times last season, if you score against Chelsea, you've got a really good chance of coming away with a victory because they have scored so few goals. And yeah, it's just going to be really interesting how how that crowd is um, at Stamford mm-hmm. Bridge on Sunday as well. I think when Villa last visited, it was Graham Potter's last game and there was chance of you don't know what you're doing when Villa scored. It was... It's not going to be anywhere near like that. I think there's still a lot of confidence in Pochettino and, and what he's got to say. And like you say, even the likes of Jackson, who's struggled in front of the goal, there's a lot of support for him. You get a few of those misses. Maybe there will be some nerves in the crowd. I'm sure the, the Villa fans will be lively, like coming off this kind of European stint, even though it didn't go their way. And there is opportunity there. And until Chelsea kind of prove otherwise that they can put teams to bed, that that is always going to be the case. Who are you worried about from our side of things? Obviously, Villa are a very good side. There's a lot of attacking talent in there. If we're looking at how do Villa win this game, and obviously this is a Villa podcast, so that's the angle I'm going to come from here. How do Villa punish Chelsea? Who are you worried about? Like you say, you, you've got to kind of look at some of those attacking players. I think the likes of uh, Diaby, I really like what I've seen from him so mm. far. Chelsea's back line is kind of one of its stronger elements, but it's then, you know, I think even last season, the likes of... Um, Jacob Ramsey and McGinn had had real success. And I think it's just kind of catching those moments maybe after the, the first clearance where you can still get mm. those second balls. And I think those players are, are going to be the real concern. I think I mentioned Dougat Chukwu before at the base of midfield. He's obviously not got a lot of experience in the league. So the players in those central positions, if they can really kind of hassle the, him in those early moments, if they can isolate Enzo Fernandez further up the pitch, if that's the role he's in again, that's going to be kind of where they find the success. I think... You know, the fullbacks for Chelsea are, are pretty strong. So maybe the success isn't necessarily going to come from out wide, even though the, there's a lot of talent in the Villa team there. I think Malagusto has done a really good job of kind of covering for Reese James during his injury. And, yeah, you know, there's Raheem Stelln on that side. So I think, yeah, I think Diaby's the one that, that does stand out for me. He, he's the one that's made it into my fantasy team last week. So um, I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to watching him. And then even Ollie Watkins, I think, his kind of relentlessness, even if he has hasn't kind of start the season on fire like sometimes he has, um, I think he is going to be a real test. And I think just having that consistent presence to challenge the Chelsea defense for all mm. they they generally do perform well. If you can challenge them time and time again, I think that there is a chance that it will be offered at some point. I'll do my score prediction later on the show when I'm speaking with John again. Let's end this segment with yours. How do you see the game going? My initial response would be a draw because Chelsea do need to prove that they can score more in one goal. But maybe with a bit of enthusiasm, I'll go 2-1 Chelsea and maybe Nicholas Jackson scores twice. Well, I absolutely hope you're wrong. Scott, thank you very much for joining me on this uh, preview. I really appreciate it and all the best for Sunday. Really glad that the opposition views back. That's generally speaking my, no disrespect, John, my favourite part of the show because we hear different insights and uh, I thought Scott was really good and, and really interesting to listen to. So Scott went for a 2-1 Chelsea, although he thought with his head it should probably be a draw. Now, if we go to our predictions, and I said in that part of the show, I'll save mine until I'm speaking with John. So it gives me a bit more time to think about it. And I'll go second because last week I had Crystal Palace spot on with a 3-1. So in our little predictions league, I've got seven points now for two correct scores. Two yeah. three ones, in fact, against Burnley away and Palace at home. You've got three points for getting the uh, result right in Everton, Burnley and Palace, but not the scoreline. So like I said, I've got a commanding lead now in the uh, predictions league, which we absolutely love to see. So I'll give you the uh, the benefit of going first. Score prediction, John, for Chelsea away. What are we saying? I don't know if it's the benefit. I haven't really thought about it. <laughs> um... <laughs> well, I waffled for long enough there to give you time. To yeah, no, no, fair enough. I mean, at some point, I'm going to have to predict a Villa, a Villa defeat, but I don't think we're going to lose at Stamford Bridge. I would just say, I think this is a barometer of where Villa are. I know people said it about Palace, and I think you did as well, Dan, which I understood. Yeah. But I do think that Villa should be beating Everton, Palace at home, and Burnley away, but also they're you know, more than likely to lose against Newcastle and Liverpool away because most teams will. But then Chelsea away is a bit up in the air because Chelsea are uh, a poor team at the moment as a collective. They've got some good individuals, but a lot of injuries as well. Five points out of five, they lost to Nottingham Forest at home who have a really poor away record. So, but it's still Chelsea. And, you know, I mean, if you're looking to get a point, then, you know, you can probably going to have to look at the context behind it and think, well, is that good or not? But if they lose, I would, 
I'd put that down to a bad defeat, really, because... Yeah, I would at the moment. I'll say one all. Okay. I'd be not happy with a point, but I'd, again, depending on the context of the game, I'd be semi-content with a with a, with a a draw away at Chelsea because I do think they can go on to have a, a decent season once they start to gel. But at the moment, they're not a good side. And we say about Villa that they, they lose against the good sides and they beat the poor sides. What side of the corner Chelsea on there? They're more exactly. poor side, aren't they? So we should be beating them. I know it's a way and everything that comes with it. Uh, and the potential they've got on Pochettino and all these different factors. I spent a billion pounds. So that they should be a better team than they are. Maybe in six months' time, as I said with Scott, they will be that. But as of right now, they're not. And we need to capitalise on that. So I'll go with a win for Villa. I'll go 2-1. But I think you know we're seeing two different ends of the spectrum here. We're not going to get into it on this show, but we might on Monday. Uh, certainly dependent on how the score goes. Villa are leaking goals away from home. You know, five against Newcastle, three Liverpool, three Legia. If we go away to Chelsea and concede lots of goals, I'll start to question why that is, especially mm. given the fact that Chelsea have scored a goal a game on average so far, didn't score against Bournemouth, didn't score against Forest. I'd still seriously start to worry about what our away record is this season. Um, so I'll go 2-1 Villa and hope that we can kind of put to bed any uh, speculation about what, what Villa are away from home and they've fixed up a little bit after after Legia yes. and Emery's kind of read them the right act. It's a test for Villa. It, it, it's kind of, um, Emery said before the Palace game, we're, we're kind of at a balance. If we win, then it's like, okay, you know, good start, I suppose. But if we lose, it's kind of, you know, where are we going? Um, yeah. Well, not where we're going, but it's kind of a poor start, isn't it? But then Chelsea, to me, is that the same? Like, you know, if you're losing to Chelsea, then it's like, okay, well, not many teams uh, are losing to them at the moment, and if you win, you kind of kind of run with it and pretend that Chelsea are still the Champions League uh, champions. <laughs> and we'll call it a day there for this episode of Inside Bodymore. Rumbled on slightly longer than we thought, considering that the press conference was four minutes long. But there's uh, plenty of talking points around the edges. John, thanks for joining me as ever. If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing on a Claret and Blue YouTube channel. And uh, if you're listening on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts, leave us a five star review. And, uh, and share the show around. We really do appreciate it. Thank you very much for watching this one. We'll see you again on Sunday uh, and up the villa.